Hi, I'm uh, Lasse, and I normally run Bitcoin Nordic, which is a Bitcoin seller in Europe. But I'm not going to talk about Bitcoin. I'm going to talk about something that, like Bitcoin, uh, has the potential to fundamentally change some of the old and very large power structures of society. I'll talk about building cities on the ocean. So let me ask you, when was the last time we saw a major innovation in political systems? I would say it was when the modern democracy was invented with the founding of the United States. But this is 300 years ago, almost 300 years ago. Imagine if you were driving a car from 300 years ago. Then you would be driving a horse. So that shows just how slow our political systems develop. So I'm going to tell you why I think seasteading, which is building floating cities on the ocean, will create innovation in government. And then I'll tell you how people are working to do it right now. So let's imagine government as an industry, almost like any other. The companies of this industry are the current governments of the world. The products these companies deliver are the laws of their country. And the customers are the residents of a country. And with this way of looking at government, we can now compare it to another industry. And why not compare it to the fast food industry? I'm willing to bet that none of you in this room have ever tried to walk into McDonald's and be requested to fill out 10 forms and put down half of your salary to get a Big Mac. How come? That's how government works, right? And one of the differences is that the fast food industry has a very low customer login. So if McDonald's treats you bad, all you need to do is go out the door, walk 20 meters down the street, and enter Burger King. On the other hand, if you're unhappy about your government, it has very high costs to switch provider. You have to sell your house. You have to find a new place to live. Probably find a new job in another country. Find new friends. You rarely get to see your family. And maybe you even have to learn a new language as you change country. There is also a good amount of innovation in fast food. New products are brought to market and new restaurants often open. And that's because fast food has a low barrier to entry. All you need to do to be a fast food entrepreneur is to rent a location, buy a frying pan, and then you're in business. But to be an entrepreneur in government is ridiculously hard. You have two options. You can either make a new polit political party and win an election, or you can create a militia and win a revolution. Good luck with that. Those are just insane barriers to entry in an industry. So to change this, we can begin seasteading. Seasteading is the technology that will make it as easy to get a home on the ocean as on land. And what could this mean politically? On the ocean, the government industry would have a much lower barrier to entry. Since existing governments have no control on the high seas, starting a new country would become as easy as buying a new home. This is an incredible opportunity for entrepreneurs. 
because government is a trillion dollar industry, the world's biggest industry. And our competitors are actually doing a pretty bad job. Some of the best competitors run with gigantic deficits, while the worst, they kill their own customers. So normally, we complain about government. But if we put our entrepreneur hats on, it's an incredibly exciting opportunity. Ocean governments would also have a smaller customer login. Imagine you're living in a country here consisting of 10 seasteads, 10 platforms, and it's decided to create an income tax of 10%. Nasty stuff. But over here, there's a group of seasteads with only 5% income tax. Because you're on the ocean, you'll be able to pull up your anchor and move your home to the other group of seasteads pretty easily. In other words, to change government provider, you don't even have to leave your home. And it's not just individuals and families that will be able to make this move more easily. This picture shows a cruise ship next to the Empire State Building. It shows that even large office complexes or factories can be moved much more easily at sea. And actually, SAB Miller, one of the world's largest breweries, have been considering creating floating breweries to be able to, quote, move with water sources, with people, with crops, or even away from severe weather, natural disasters, or political instability. So these are very real prospects. The legal framework that makes this possible is the United Nations Law of the Seas. So out until 12 nautical miles, the land government has the same power as on land. Beyond 12 miles from the coast, you can do pretty much whatever you want. However, the land government reserves the right to exploit natural resources, such as oil, out until 220 miles. Humans are a natural land species, so to live on the ocean, we need to solve a few technical problems. The good news is that cruise ships have already solved most of them, and cruise ships are essentially temporary floating cities. So to get water, um, cruise ships desalinate uh, seawater, which works very well. You could also collect rainwater. For food, you could fish, obviously, do aquaculture, fish farming. Um, but you could, of course, also import for, uh, food from land. A common misconception about uh, seasteading is that now you have to be self-sufficient when you live on the ocean. Um, but there's no real reason why you would do that if you can um, import food from hundreds of different countries with different climates and, and different foods to get variety. Electricity. Cruise ships uh, traditionally use diesel generators. It works pretty well. But of course, uh, on the ocean, there is plenty of opportunity to use solar cells, wind energy, even wave energy. Communication. Cruise ships and container ships uh, use satellite communication. There are some challenges with uh, latency when you communicate with a satellite. So if you're closer to land, you can also use uh, microwave technology with antennas on the coast and on the ship. But actually, people are developing uh, low orbit satellites that will dramatically lower the latency uh, in communicating with satellites. So that's an interesting possibility. So on the ocean, how do you make a living um, if you're not self-sufficient? Well, if you, if you live 12 miles from land, um, where you can do most of what you want to do. Um, you can get to land in just 30 minutes if you have a speedboat. And that allows you to keep your land job. Uh, I mean, many people commute more than 30 minutes today. 
but also the internet allows more and more people to work from home. And as seasteading society reaches um, a certain size, then regular companies such as supermarkets will start to employ people on board. So, but the, it gets really interesting when we look at which uh, new ventures would be possible to create on a seasteading because of this special regulatory environment. And one possibility could be maybe it will be useful to run a Bitcoin exchange um, uh, in a different jurisdiction than where all your customers are. So you could be on the ship uh, running in a different jurisdiction, but only be 30 minutes from all your customers in the US, for instance. You could also run a hospital and um, dig into the medical tourism industry. Um, a lot of Americans will travel to Asia, Singapore, uh, India to get uh, medical treatments. On a seastead, just 30 minutes from the coast, you would be able to offer many of the same um, opportunities. You could facilitate research and treatment in regulated areas, such as stem cell research or other areas. Server hosting. You could create a patent-free zone. You could do aquaculture, fish farming. You could run a casino, and I believe there has already been people doing this sort of thing uh, from the east coast of the US, uh, sailing ships out from New York, um, letting people uh, gamble, and then the ship would return to New York. And of course, you could uh, have medical marijuana dispensaries um, uh, in case you're near a jurisdiction where this is not uh, legal. So this is, this is uh, one of the really, really interesting prospects of seasteading. How could you um, use this special regulatory environment to uh, create entirely new business opportunities? There are some threats to deal with. And one of the most popular ones are, of course, pirates. Um, but it turns out that they're actually not a very big threat because uh, pirates tend to be geographically uh, concentrated on the globe. Uh, you'll find them in the Indian Ocean, especially, and not so much anywhere else. Um, so if you're not there, you, uh, you, you're, you have a pretty good case. Also, pirates are usually lightly armed, so they're easy to defend against. And they usually attack um, container ships and freighters because they have a lot of valuable goods, but very few people to be causing any trouble. Whereas uh, cruise ships with a lot of passengers and not many goods, they don't attack them that often because that's just too much trouble with all the people being able to resist. And a residential seastead will um, be much more like a cruise ship than a container ship in that regard. The biggest threat is probably from existing governments. Um, so you will need to have a, a, a good PR strategy is probably the, the best way to do it. You should, you should win their sympathy. You should, um, you should start out with a business that is popular among the population. So for instance, if you're running a hospital that saves lives, then it's going to look pretty bad if some politician goes out to shut you down. Uh, he might not be elected next time. And I'm, I'm originally, originally from Copenhagen in Denmark, where we have this free town, Christiania. And uh, it, was, it was a bunch of people who took over an army base in, in about 40 years ago. And no administration has dared to shut them down because they had a pretty good, um, they were popular with the general population. So any administration, left wing or right wing, um, they are not to shut them down because they were afraid they would not get re-elected. So I think that's going to be the right strategy for sea stats as well. So avoid very controversial stuff such as drugs and guns, but do stuff like medical tourism, um, uh, bringing, bringing, uh, bringing, uh, creating an, a visa-free zone, uh, which there's actually a venture uh, working to do right now, and I'll tell you more about it in a minute. So the Seasteading Institute is, this, is a non-profit organization founded in 2008 that does uh, research 
into engineering, law and business uh, regard, uh, with, the, with regards to seasteading. Um, they're currently working to establish a price that's going to be given to the first seastead with at least 50 citizens. And it's modeled after the X prize, which was a prize that was given to the first uh, company that brought a vessel into orbit, uh, in, in space orbit, twice a week. And this prize was for $10 million, but it's estimated that $100 million was invested by the companies competing for the prize. So the strategy here is to establish a similar price, um, but get this leverage. So you establish a price of X dollars and you get perhaps 10 times uh, the investments from, from company, companies competing for it. Uh, Randall Fanken is the executive director and he's here at the conference and you can meet, you can meet him in the Seasteading Institute booth uh, in, the, uh, in the big hall. It was founded by Patrick Friedman, um, and a previous Google engineer, and he's a grandson of Milton Friedman, the economist. And Peter Thiel is, uh, if you don't know him, he's the founder of PayPal, and he was an early investor in Facebook. But most importantly, you can donate to the Seasteading Institute with bitcoins, and I'll give you the address in just a bit. So where the Seasteading Institute can be seen as an industry organization, non-profit organization. Blue Seed is an actual seasteading venture, and it'll be a startup incubator outside of Silicon Valley, where you can start a company without having an American visa. So more than 40% of American venture capital is invested in Silicon Valley. So if you're an entrepreneur, it's probably the best place in the world to be. But there is no American visa that fits the entrepreneur that doesn't have any money but has a great idea. So that's where Blue Seed is going to create this visa-free ship. They're going to launch in about a year and Dan from Blue Seed uh, will be giving a talk about this tomorrow at this very conference. That's Dan. And I highly recommend that you check that out. It's a really uh, cool project. So Bitcoin and seasteading as projects are in many ways alike. Both Bitcoin and seasteading have bottom-up approaches uh, to problem solving. They both rely on movements, grassroots and entrepreneurs to succeed instead of banks or governments. <laughs> so how can Bitcoin help seasteading? Obviously, any nation or community needs a currency. I think a seasteader is likely to become the first nation to use Bitcoin as the standard form of money. And how can seasteading help Bitcoin? Some Bitcoin ventures may be able to benefit from locating on a seasteader because it could allow them to be in a different legal jurisdiction than their customers, but still physically close. For instance, um, there might be European or Caribbean jurisdictions that are favorable to running a Bitcoin exchange. And that could be run on a ship off the coast of California. But it would still be just half an hour away from business partners in Silicon Valley and customers in the US. So imagine if all the money going into lobbyism and political campaigns in the last 10 years had instead been spent on building a hundred new countries at sea. We might have discovered democracy 2.0 or something even better. And that's why I think that seasteading, just like Bitcoin, has the potential to improve the world enormously for the better. And here are some links for, mo for you to, to read more about it. Seasteading.org is the Seasteading Institute. This is their Bitcoin address. Um, they have accepted Bitcoins for a year, I think, early movers. Blueseed.co is the visa-free startup ship. A thousandnations.com is a political blog about how competitive government can make, uh, can create uh, innovation in government. 
So if you do nothing else, go to seasteading.org and sign up for their newsletter. Uh, you'll be informed of any new countries created. So thanks, and I'm open to questions. Howdy. Thanks for that presentation. Um, Right now, international waters exists because nobody's really out there. But once start, people start setting up these uh, these communities outside, do you think that regulation will happen to maybe expand international waters further out, or the, potentially restrict some of these people, like just going right outside the border? Right. There is um, there's a number of ways that government could um, make life hard for these seasteads. Um, and I'm pretty sure they will figure out something if they don't like the seasteads. So that's why I think the, the, the most important uh, strategy is to, um, to, to be likable, uh, to do stuff that, uh, that very obviously benefits uh, society. Um, and that's things like, like Blue Sheet, uh, which will bring entrepreneurs to America, and that's things like medical tourism that will save lives. If you do that, I think any politician will be very unpopular if he messes with you. And about the whole blue sea, like when they're bringing in people for visa -less, I guess, entrepreneurship, what does that entail if they come to shore to like do business or anything? Like are there going to be local check-in points at just local docks or something? Or like, it, it seems like it'd be an entry point for somebody to come from another country and be able to sneak into right. other countries. Uh, Dan, do you want to save questions for tomorrow or you want to answer now? Okay. Hey everyone, my name is Dan Daskalescu. I'm uh, the CTO of Blue Seed. Uh, to answer that question, we're going to have a uh, Customs and Border Protection port of entry in Half Moon Bay, which is the home port of Blue Seed. And uh, as an entrepreneur, you go through the port, they scan your passport, then uh, you are in the US for business purposes. You cannot work there. You need to work on the ship. But the process is very similar to arriving, uh, say, in SFO via plane from Vancouver. So you can think of Blue Seed as uh, a Vancouver that's only half an hour away. Thanks. We spoke with a few officials that cannot make public statements, but they support the idea. And uh, moreover, they want to experiment using us as a guinea pig for fast-tracking people. Because right now, you have to present a passport, get a stamp. And stamps are not going to scale if you do this every day. So they, are, uh, they want to experiment with um, scanning the mag stripe of passports using an electronic kiosk. It would be a great example. I don't want to steal Lasse's time, so uh, ask me tomorrow. So on a lot of the um, seasteading websites, there are these really cool visualizations of platform-based seasteads. And um, talking with other people who are interested in seasteading, the few people that have actually lived for long periods of time on the ocean, people who have been in the Navy, people who have been full-time cruisers on you know, boats of their own, they kind of, you know, they see those images and laugh a little bit and feel like the existing um, communities of uh, full-timers living on boats who go to rallies and kind of have more ad hoc and modular, you know, lifestyles on the ocean are truly the face of seasteading. And I wonder kind of how you, how you compare the two. What do you see as maybe the things missing from the existing lifestyles of people living on the sea compared to, you know, what maybe you consider a full seastead? Right. Um, th the people living full-time on the ocean today, they have a tremendous experience and there's a lot to be gained from learning from them, and I think the whole seasteading community can, can learn from them. The, the main difference from what they're doing and from what seasteading, seasteading is about is, is that uh, seasteading is um, it's the, um, it's the idea that you can use this way of living to achieve social change, um, which is something that the current um, people living on the oceans are not really um, exploiting. So it's... Um, so, so it's, there, there's a lot to learn from these guys, definitely. And, and I think the Seasteading Institute are researching uh, what current ocean livers are doing. Um, and then that, that knowledge uh, is just going to be applied to, uh, a new, um, to a new type of problem with seasteading. Yeah. 
Hi, thanks for your presentation. Hey, you, you mentioned in, um, in one of the slides about the 12 mile um, extent of uh, limits to international waters. When there is a new seasteading nation created, it would then claim the 12 miles around it in the same way that other nations would, yeah? And then my question is, what is the criteria by which you get recognized as a nation by Agreed. the UN to do that? So that's, um, that's a pretty, th that's an interesting question. It's not of um, immediate concern. Um, I think that the first concern is to, to get out there and show that this can be a viable form of living. Then as you grow, when you have millions of people out there or hundreds of thousands, um, I think the UN will start to look at you and uh, then you could start considering uh, getting a seat in the UN. But there is no, there is no standardized way of getting uh, the official uh, proof or stamp of being a recognized nation because there is no super um, world government that hands out these stamps. The, the way to get to, to become a recognized nation is just to have uh, surrounding countries um, recognize you as a nation. Um, um, and today there are, there are actually many nations out there that only have approval of being a nation from like half the world or even uh, a, a smaller part of the world. So it's a process, um, and, but in the, in, in, in the beginning we, the, the focus is on, on getting out there and then this will come later. Hello. Has your organization reached out to the municipality of Sealand? And if not, what is your opinion on them? Randy, do you have something to say about this? Well, we haven't spoken directly with Sealand, uh, but our opinion is there a good um, demonstration of a group that has gone out and gotten this back to the Is there a model of how it's going to happen? All right, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for your presentation, and I uh, really love the project. Um, my question is, um, obviously, if you would move to Blue Seed or whatever, you will be living there for, um, um, like, if the point is um, getting uh, bootstrapped there for more than half a year, you would be starting paying your tax to your uh, local seastead. Seastead, and uh, like, what will be your legal status? Like, what country will you be in? What's what's um, how how like um, your mother country will probably want to take your taxes? Like, where is your company um, incorporated in? Like, will you like you know like all sorts of questions which can be easily answered if you're in whatever uh, existing country, but um, how do you do business in a currently non-existing jurisdiction. Okay, um, so there is no uh, standard seasteading answer to this that, that where you can say that this is going to be the jurisdiction for all seasteads. Um, each seastead could have, could find different solutions to these, um, to these issues. F to take Blue Seed as an example, I believe they plan to register the, fl uh, the, the ship in Bahamas. That means um, uh, the, the laws of Bahamas will apply on board, but of course uh, Blue Seed will have their own set of rules built on top of that um, where, they, where they can, uh, for instance, it's, it's their property so they can decide uh, which startups are allowed to start on board. Uh, are you allowed to uh, smoke marijuana on board? Uh, are you allowed to do gambling? Such things. Um, and so that's going to be completely up to the, to the Blue Seed jurisdiction. As for criminal matters like uh, robbery and uh, violence, um, that would th there is an, an existing uh, legal framework to handle this because this is what uh, cruise ships and container ships already do. Uh, they, they, they register their ship in some country like the Bahamas or Marshall Islands or Panama and when they have a criminal case on board there's already an, an established um, way to deal with this. So. It's, it's, uh, it's a solved problem. Very interesting. Um, I, I'm interested also in this picture, this image of a seastead kind of like built on pillars. It needs the water to not be very deep to do that. Um, th this is actually a, f 
a floating model. Um, this is a concept. This, no, it's, this is based on an actual design um, produced by a, an engineering naval engineering firm. And this is a, this is a floating platform. So you also have similar designs in um, in the oil rig industry, um, where you have these. Most of the buoyancy of, of this platform is is uh, maybe 50 feet below the uh, the water level, uh, which may, makes it more stable. So. So you, you can be at any water depth with, uh, with this kind of structure. And then you anchor to the ground, or is it actually stabilized dynamically? There are uh, multiple ways to do it. You could, you could anchor uh, or more, um, or you could use dynamic positioning, where you have uh, engines running on the structure that will automatically keep you in place. Um, depending on, on what you're doing and depending on the legal circumstances, um, Different sea states will probably use different solutions. Um, Thank you if, very much. Yeah, sure. I, uh, I couldn't help but think of a company called ASIC Miner, which just broke $100 million market cap. Um, perhaps the first publicly traded Bitcoin company to have issued shares online and then reached a $100 million market cap. So I'm thinking about seasteading and how can Bitcoin help seasteading? And I'm thinking, well, if you want to launch a Seastead plan, you can gather funding already. As a for-profit enterprise, you can sell shares online. There are lots of exchanges, and we're working on distributed exchanges for colored coins and things like that. So you can launch a for-profit enterprise and start getting funding today. I'm ready to throw money at it, you know? <laughs> Give me a project, you know? I understand, and this is just one example. And I think Blue Seed is exciting. I can't wait for your, your talk tomorrow. Um, but I also like the point about multiple seasteads. Not all of them will be for profit, but this is one viable option for for profit enterprises to start getting funding today. All we need is a plan. I think there's a lot of us ready. So, Excellent point. Yeah. Just real quick in regards to the uh, recognition by ISO, is who does the country code recognition. That's about a 14-month process. I'm sort of intimately involved and know about it. Also under the UPU, which is Universal Postal Union, which comes out of Basel, Switzerland, would be able to determine your seasteading as its own country with its own UPU, UPU code. So I don't know if you're aware of that. So. Regarding postal mail, I think that will be um also something you, you don't, that's, that's a smaller issue in the beginning. Um, a lot of communication now takes place electronically. Um, but of course, at some point, you, you want to apply for these UPU codes. Yeah. If, if you stay for too long on your CSTED? Yeah, what if you can't get back into a country? What, is, what happens then? Um, so if, if a CSTED is an independent country, it would be like, if you're American, like you traveling to Canada or, or Mexico, and the, the same problems and issues that you could have there, you could also have on a CSET, and also the same solutions would apply. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, remember, Blue Seat Talk tomorrow.